In this episode, I'm going to discuss how your sensory input can take you out of your safety state without you even realizing it, active and passive safety cues, and the context of safety cues. My name is Justin Sinceri. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist that thinks the world needs a new understanding of mental health. Welcome to Stuck Not Broken. This podcast is not therapy, nor is it intended to be a replacement for therapy. I got a question here from one of my building safety anchors, Stuck Knots. They uh, put a question. I'm not going to go into the whole question, the whole context, but just kind of take out the main question from it. Uh, But they put this in the uh, building safety anchors group discussion. And I thought it was interesting. So I wanted to bring it here to you. Uh, Basically, what it boils down to is can sensory overload bring you out of your safety state? And in particular, can washing your hands be a safety cue or a safety anchor? I'm going to talk about a few things, uh, active and passive safety cues, uh, passive safety cues that build up out of your uh, conscious awareness, like the intensity of them kind of add up and multiply, uh, or at least add up, I don't know about multiply, maybe multiply, I don't know. Uh, and then wash, washing hands as a safety cues. But really what I'm interested in there is the context of the safety cue or the safety anchor. So first off, we I've talked a lot on this podcast about safety cues, safety anchors, things that bring you to your safety state, right? In his uh, latest book, Polyvagal Safety, Dr. Porges specifically lays out uh, safety, I'm sorry, passive safety cues and active safety cues. The basic idea is that passive safety cues are ones that uh, are neuroceptive to safety. So things that are neuroceptive to safety that might trigger your safety state that you're not actively doing. They just kind of come in through your senses. So that could be things like, well, like right now I have a candle on with a pleasant smell, something I got at Target. I think it's a Christmas smell, but I like it a lot still. I don't know. I can't tell what it is. I just like it. And I have a little um, fake plant thing here that I like. (laughs) Uh, The lighting in my office, uh, the comfortable seating, all these things I just take in passively. I'm not really consciously thinking about them. I could, but I'm not consciously thinking about the scent of the candle. But but that scent is still affecting me every single moment that I'm breathing in. So it's passive. It's just kind of there. You could mindfully actively notice these things, experience them, feel them, and experience the safety that it you know does bring up within you. But these things are passive. When I have the right lighting in here, it's just a passive safety cue. A more active safety cue is something that, or safety anchor, is something that you actively do. That could be uh, going out for a jog, that could be meditation, that could be breath work, that could be yoga, that could be things that I might be broadening it beyond what he was discussing Portis in that book. Uh, I forget the name of the article because it's a collection of articles in the book, but he was specifically talking about rituals and in the context of uh, religion, I believe. So he was specifically talking about things like, I believe, um, chanting, if I'm remembering correctly, uh, yoga, I think was in there. So stuff like that. But I think that concept could easily be brought into other things that you do to feel a sense of safety or relief. And that could be, in my opinion, that could be swing, sw- swimming. That could be uh, spending time with friends. These are things that you are actively doing, your choices that you're making to go and do. And that maybe it's just breathing quietly in the corner and really mindfully being with uh, the the uh, experience of your breath. That so all of these things, in my opinion, would be more active safety cues, things that you're doing. So active and passive safety cues. This is really important to understand, and these are topics I talk a little bit more in depth about in the poly or in the building safety anchors course, not polyvagal one on one. That's my other course. In the building safety anchors course, these are things I talk about in a little bit more depth. But that, for now, that's the basic idea. I think actually this is really important to understand, and I'm glad uh, that he covered those in that article in that book because that kind of broadens my concepts of of the polyvagal theory. So active safety cues, passive safety cues. And I think this applies also to 
active or actually probably more passive uh, danger cues, things that are going to take you out of your safety state, down your polyvagal ladder into more of a flight, fight, shutdown, maybe even freeze as well. But if they're passive, uh, I'm more focused on them taking you out of your safety state. Passive safety cues, and I would say also the passive danger cues, these things can, and I'm more focused on the danger cues, these can, these things can uh, build up. They can seemingly sort of build up and compile, and it's like one on top of the other. And that could be, I guess, a collection of uh, safety cues that bring you up your polyvagal ladder. But what I'm more focused on right here are the collection of danger cues that bring you down your polyvagal ladder and out of your safety state. These are like just small insults to your system. And these are, again, passive. So small insults to your system, things that you probably don't control, or you, maybe you could, um, and we'll go over a couple examples, but things that you um, that are just kind of there, they're, they're there in the environment, you may not have any control over them. You, I guess you some of these you probably could. So one example would be like um, the sound of a, a heater or air conditioning in the background, just those like hums or like a refrigerator hum, just those like sounds of traffic in my office here. I, I take all the, these sounds out by the time this, uh, you know, it gets published, but I hear traffic. There's a freeway off in the distance. It's not too far. Obviously, it's close enough for me to hear it. So that dull hum of the freeway, even in my, my office, which is pretty sound dampened, I still hear it when I'm sitting outside in the backyard. Uh, I can definitely hear just this dull hum of traffic. Now, it's is that enough for me to, like, get up and run away? No. but it definitely affects my system. If you put if you if that sound were all of a sudden gone and there was actual quiet and I'm sitting in the backyard, the the experience, the mindful experience of being in my safe, my safety state would probably be a lot uh higher. And that's probably why I I noticed within myself that I have this big impulse to be in quiet. I really want my wife and I we want to buy like a or even rent, I guess, a like but we're really, really buy though. Uh, like a cabin in the woods, just a place to go to escape from everybody and everything and all the sounds and just kind of have actual quiet. We really want that. And we, we do not, you don't get that in the city, right? Sounds of the environment. That's, that's one passive danger cue. It could also be other things in the environment like lighting. Uh, when I go to work, I have bright white fluorescent lights that are everywhere. And that's just kind of the standard when you work at like a school district or probably in a hospital, things like that. It's just white walls, probably. For me, it is white walls, bright white fluorescent lighting, a little bit of a hum from that too. Uh, but those would be passive danger cues. It's not something you really focus on or notice, but it just it does affect your system. Uh, also, for me, outside my office, there's the sound of students and teachers. There's I do definitely have an AC. I definitely have a he- heater going that I don't control. There's a train that passes by a few times a day. So there's all of these passive things that happen I do not control, but they're just kind of there and they absolutely affect my system. How about also uh, people you see uh, when you walk you know, through a store or when you go into work or when you're at work and you see people with flat affect, people who are not smiling. Maybe they're not mean, but they just kind of have this blunted like flat affect. Again, that's a passive kind of a danger cue a small one now it's not enough to get you to run away hopefully it's not enough to get you to fight but it does affect your system in in just a teeny tiny little bit like a little insult to your system this is uh different than like probably things that are big insults to your system where someone maybe is uh coming at you more aggressively They, they do have an angry face you do go to a job that you act you absolutely hate and you feel that hatred like you intensely cannot stand where you go to work uh, maybe you have some family issues that are erupting that are major issues that you cannot ignore. Maybe there's media that you choose to take in that are constantly giving you and saturating you in danger cues and be afraid of these people and hate these people. Those are probably, I would say, bigger insults to your system. They may be passive, not exactly. I wouldn't call them active. Maybe we, we could call them active because on some level you could choose to stop doing these things. You could choose to switch your media, right? So maybe there's some level of control you have here. So when I say passive danger cues, I'm not really talking about the big ones. I'm more focused on those small environmental pieces, things that come into you through your sensory experience. 
that you probably don't have control. Maybe you do, but probably don't. By the way, if you're really enjoying this topic of safety cues, I have a course called Building Safety Anchors, which talks really in depth about this stuff and helps you to identify what brings you to safety, which is so important. It is so important for future trauma work. If you're going to delve into more difficult stuff, you have to be able to access and stay in your state of safety in order to deal with that stuff, to feel it, to talk about it, and on some level even relive it. You have to be able to stay in your safety state in order for that to be successful. So I have a course that's called Building Safety Anchors that teaches you what safety is, how to identify it, how to mindfully exist in it, and it has six different paths that help you to get there. So on top of the exclusive video and resources that the course gives you, you can also be a part of a, a discussion group where people can go and ask questions or share their uh, their wins. And that's on justinlmft.com. That's also where you can go to buy the course or to find out more information about the course, justinlmft.com. You can also email me, uh, same thing, justinlmft at gmail.com. Now let's talk about washing your hands. And I'm going to broaden this to not just washing your hands, but what's the context of washing your hands? So can washing your hands be a safety cue? Yeah, sure. I mean, just in general, yeah. But what what I'm more concerned about is what about washing your hands is a safety cue? Because it's not just the action. Maybe the you know rubbing your hands together. Maybe that's a safety cue. Maybe it's the water. Uh, maybe it's just feeling clean, I guess, or the act of cleaning yourself. But there's other things going on when you're washing your hands. So I want you to not just with this example, but uh, notice when it comes to, you know, things that you feel pulled toward, like maybe it is washing your hands. Maybe it is, you know, jogging or working out or drawing or swimming, whatever it is that you feel pulled towards. It might not be just the action. Maybe there's more going on contextually that you feel this pull towards, that you feel this safety pull towards. So notice the entire context of what it is. So let's talk about washing your hands in particular. Usually when we wash our hands, we're in a bathroom or I guess some, you know, a sink somewhere, but I'm imagining a bathroom, but this could also be a kitchen sink. It could be a public bathroom. Uh, so basically when we go to wash our hands, typically we're alone or closer to be alone, being alone, or we're at least removed from other people or potentially other danger cues. The point here is that typically when we go to wash our hands, it's a smaller environment, right? There's less stimulation, potentially. There's some sense of aloneness. You might have an opportunity to like breathe. You may have an opportunity to slow down. You may be out of a context that you don't want to be in. Maybe in that bathroom, the lighting is a bit dimmer and that feels better for your system. Versus, you know, like if you go to a loud restaurant, there definitely could be dim lighting. But if you go to a restaurant where it's really loud, that may be overstimulating. But if you go to the bathroom and wash your hands or use the restroom or just whatever, uh, that could be an opportunity to escape from that overstimulating environment to an environment that has a reduction in stimulation. So maybe it's not washing your hands. Maybe it's just the change in environment. But also when you go to wash your hands, you might be in a place where you're alone or more likely to be alone. There may be something soothing in that environment where you're washing your hands, like the smell of your soap. Uh, or maybe there's some decorations on the wall. Like maybe there's a decoration. Maybe there's some wonderful old ship lap on the wall that you just kind of feel good or, you know, when you look at. There also just might be a chance to breathe. Maybe you have a chance to slow down and breathe when you're washing your hands in this little or smaller environment. But there's also the temperature of the water. Maybe that just kind of feels good. Uh, maybe the feel of the water feels good or is a, is a safety cue, basically. So it's not just the action of washing your hands. That could be part of it as well. But there's a whole bunch of things that come into play when you're washing your hands. The same thing we could say, let's say, uh, for me, I like to go swimming. Now, the action of swimming is absolutely grounding for me, the, the physical movement. But my backyard has a ton of green in it. I, I like that a lot. It's very soothing. It's relatively quiet. The dogs can get kind of annoying, sure, and there's traffic, yeah. But when I go into water, I don't hear much of anything. That actually provides this kind of sensory dampening that my system kind of likes. So is it just the swimming? No, there's a whole bunch of stuff that comes along with it. A beautiful sunny day, that's a safety cue in and of itself as well. What I would encourage you to do is whatever it is that you feel this pull towards that may feel like safety, uh, kind of notice it. 
and notice, you know, what is helping you. What what of the context is actually appealing? What of the context that you're in do you find to be grounding or to be a safety cue or safety anchor? What is the what's passive in that environment that works for you? And what are you actively doing that works for you? The sunshine when I go outside and swim tomorrow afternoon is going to be a passive safety cue. Me going underwater and swimming and pushing off the wall, kicking off the walls, that's an active safety cue, things that I can do. But so no, notice these pieces that, you know, the next time that you're grounding yourself and really mindfully experience it. And I, I really want you to do so because these things can become these like default kind of compulsions. We, I mean, you could easily think of someone who just keeps washing their hands because it's somehow, something about it feels right. And I'm not exactly talking about OCD. I'm talking about just general. I'm using the compulsion more generally here. Although, yeah, it might have a lot to do with OCD as well. I, I think that these, these things that kind of seem to make us feel better can become compulsions in a sense. And that's, that's not a safety anchor. That's different. That's something different. That would be more of this, uh, like a behavioral adaptation. And yeah, was, uh, compulsive washing of hands could totally be that. It's a, it's a behavioral adaptation. It's something that we compulsively engage in or even reflexively engage in because it somehow seems to do something to our state. It helps us to regulate enough to where that defensive state's not out of control. It's not exactly relief, but it's just less crumminess, I guess I would, I would say, put it that way. So it's kind of better. Better as an evaluation. It's kind of a reduction in, in uh, pain, maybe. But that's, that's different. That's a behavioral adaptation. That's not really a safety anchor. It's not really a, genuinely a safety cue. Um, so just be mindful of that when you feel these the pull or maybe even a compulsion toward these things. That's it, though. If you are interested in learning more about building safety anchors, go to justinlmft.com. Fellow Stuck Knot, I do hope you've learned something new to help you in your own process of getting unstuck. Um, I do have the course and a whole bunch of resources on justinlmft.com. Thank you so much for listening. Bye. This podcast is not therapy, not intended to be therapy or be a replacement for therapy. Nothing in this creates or indicates a therapeutic relationship. Please consult with your therapist or seek for one in your area if you are experiencing mental health symptoms. Nothing in this podcast should be construed to be specific life advice. It is for educational and entertainment purposes only. More resources are available in the description of this episode and in the footer of justinlmft.com.